Good morning. This is Ron. It is Tuesday, July the 3rd, and welcome to Storytime. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America, and probably the only uh, true uh, conservative in uh, the world, period. Uh, talking to all you butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. Uh, so one of the things I want to clarify, there's I've been saying that one of the things she, that has to happen in order to uh, ha- get, achieve better results and actually end up rendering socialism politically ineffective is that conservatives have to walk their talk. You can't be... Uh, vote conservative and act like a liberal. You got to you got to get it together, and you have to um, uh, be conservative through and through. What that means, essentially, in essence, is you have to acknowledge reality. Because fundamentally, what the left is trying to do is, is get people enough people to question reality or um, refuse to acknowledge reality, pretend that uh, reality is what the majority says it is, which is not true. Reality just is. So uh, that's what the thing that you have to do. You've got to uh, be able to acknowledge reality, and you've got to be able to do it each and every day, all day, every day, in order to... Um, have an internal consistency, and to have that consistency then will uh, improve your integrity, and your integrity, your credibility, and your credibility, your influence. And you're doing it as much for yourself as you are doing it for anyone else. If you're holding two ideas, two conflicting ideas in your mind at the same time, uh, you can't do that for long. You've got to go one one direction or another. So if you're going to uh, be uh, try to hold uh, conservative and uh, socialist values or socialist anti-values, conservative values and socialist anti-values, something has to give somewhere. Um, and so you may very well end up being and living like a socialist, paying lip service to conservatism, but uh, living like a socialist. And eventually uh, you're going to uh, go that direction politically. You may not vote for a socialist, but you may end up calling up your conservative representative or your conservative senator or whatever and demanding that they uh, not restrict abortion or that they um, vote against a particular conservative bill that may be, uh, uh, may be a religious freedom act or something of that nature. Because, again, you're used to, uh, you like the idea of voting for a conservative, uh, but uh, you want to live uh, like a liberal. You want to go out and... Uh, smoke dope whenever you want to. You like that kind of an arrangement. And uh, so, and uh, psychologically, it's bad for you. You've got to make up your mind. If you're, if you're a socialist, you're a socialist. Go be a socialist until you learn that socialism is no good for anybody, not as an individual, not as a group. And um, so, in the meantime, if you've de- determined that you, you are conservative, want to be conservative, act like it. Like I said, for your own psychological benefit, for your own happiness, and also for the influence of other people. If a teenager, somebody that's young that's uh, looking for political advice, what uh, political party should I belong to, you want to present a credible, um, uh, you want to present credibility to them. You want them to walk away thinking, I'm, I'm going to do what this person says because they're, they've got it together. They say that they uh, are conservative, they say conservatism is better, and I believe them because uh, of their lifestyle. They they live a lifestyle that acknowledges reality and uh, with a minimum amount of time spent in imagination uh, and uh, uh, in unreality, for lack of a better term. So that's the, uh, the thing that you have to do. It has to You have to have that kind of commitment to uh, conservatism or uh, you're not going to, um, again, have much influence. An example of that would be um, the rhinos. All the people that are considered rhinos in politics, uh, John McCain, 
chief among them, who is a guy that talks about being a conservative or talks about being a Republican, but really lives more like a uh, socialist or a, quote, liberal, unquote. So um, if you want, you, this, and that's, this is fundamentally where the battle is. So in order to win, you've got to get your act together. So uh, when I come back, I'm going to go ahead and walk my own talk and by um, bringing up some positives about uh, President Trump, some of the positive things that's been going on and, and things that he's been doing. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, so on to some uh, good news about uh, President Trump. And uh, we're going to do it from uh, Twitter, from some of his tweets, appropriately enough. And uh, on one of them, it says that he interviewed four impressive people yesterday. And on Monday, will be announcing his decision for justice of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, let's see. And then uh, yesterday, it was uh, his great honor to welcome Prime Minister Mark Rutte of the Netherlands to the White House. Um, let me see what else. Uh, he also congratulated Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador on becoming the next president of Mexico. He looks very f uh, forward very much to working with him. And by the way, Obrador is, at least according to uh, news sources that uh, I've read, a socialist. Uh, let's see. Um, so, and that's going to do it uh, for today on the uh, good news about uh, Donald Trump's situation here. Uh, let me see what else we've got here. And now I'm, I'm going to uh, next uh, go ahead and read from the um, Ayn Rand interview of 1964, the Ayn Rand Playboy interview of 1964 when we come back. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, we're back, and uh, I'll be reading from the uh, 1964 Playboy interview of Ayn Rand, and I've been uh, reading um, segments from this uh, particular interview and commenting and, and critiquing on it, um, and again, she stumbles in this interview like do most people, because the left uh, has a tendency to use some very subtle and nuanced uh, techniques in order to... Uh, psychologize the conversation in order to create a debate under the guise of conducting an interview. And it is, since it is subtle, it's hard to pick up and it is um, therefore, thereby hard to deal with. You, it's hard for people, to, if they don't know what uh, the left is doing, to counter it, so to speak. So, back to the uh, 1964 interview. Playboy, according to your philosophy, work and achievement are the highest goals of life. Do you regard as immoral those who find greater fulfillment in the warmth of friendship and family ties? Rand, if they place such things as friendship and family ties above their own productive work, yes, then they are immoral. Friendship, family life, and human relationships are not primary in a man's life. A man who places others first above his own creative work is an emotional parasite, whereas if he places his work first, there is no conflict between his work and his enjoyment of human relationships. Playboy, do you believe that women, as well as men, should organize their lives around work? And if so, what kind of work? Ayn Rand, of course. I believe that women are human beings. What is proper for a man is proper for a woman. A woman, the basic principles are the same. I would not attempt to prescribe what kind of work a man should do, and I would not attempt it in regard to women. There is no particular work which is specifically feminine. Women can choose their work according to their own purpose and premises in the same manner as men do. Playboy, in your opinion, is a woman immoral who chooses to devote herself to home and family instead of a career? Rand, not immoral. I would say she is impractical because a home cannot be a full-time occupation except when her children are young. However, if she wants a family and wants to make that her career, at least for a while, it would be proper. If she approaches it as a career... That is, if she studies the subject, if she defines the rules and principles by which she wants to bring up her children, if she approaches her task in an intellectual manner. It is a very responsible task and a very important one, 
but only when treated as a science, not as an mere emotional indulgence. Playboy, where would you say should a romantic love fit into the life of a rational person whose single driving passion is work? Rand, it is his greatest reward. The only m man capable of experiencing a profound romantic love is the man driven by passion for his work, because love is an expression of self-esteem, of the deepest values in a man's or woman's character. One falls in love with the person who shares these values. If a man has no clearly defined values and no moral character, he is not able to appreciate another person. In this respect, I would like to quote from The Fountainhead, in which the hero utters a line that has often been quoted by readers. Quote, to say, I love you, one must first know how to say the I. Unquote. Playboy, you hold that one's own happiness is the highest end and that self-sacrifice is immoral. Does this apply to love as well as work? Rand, to love more than to uh, to love more than to anything else. When you are in love, it means that the person you love is of great personal selfish importance to you and to your life. If you were selfless, it would have to mean that you derive no personal pleasure or happiness from the company and the existence of the person you love, and that you are motivated only by self-sacrificial pity for that person's need of you. I don't have to point out to you that no one would be flattered by, nor would accept, a concept of that kind. Love is not a self-sacrifice, but the most profound assertion of your own needs and values. It is for your own happiness that you need the person you love, and that is the greatest compliment, the greatest tribute you can pay to that person. Playboy, you have denounced the Puritan notion that physical love is ugly or evil, yet you have written, quote, indiscriminate desire and unselective indulgence are possible only to those who regard sex and themselves as evil, unquote. Would you say that discriminate and selective indulgence in sex is moral? Rand, I would say that a selective and discriminate sex life is not an indulgence. The term indulgence implies that it is an action taken lightly and casually. I say that sex is one of the most important aspects of man's life and, therefore, must never be approached lightly or casually. A sexual relationship is proper only on the ground of the highest values one can find in a human being. Sex must not be anything other than a response to values, and that is why I consider promiscuity immoral, not because sex is evil, but because sex is too good and too important. Playboy, does this mean, in your view, that sex should only involve married partners. Rand, not necessarily. What sex should involve is a very serious relationship. Whether that relationship should or should not become a marriage is a question which depends on the circumstances and the context of the two persons' lives. I consider marriage a very important institution, but it is important when and if two people have found the person with whom they wish to spend the rest of their lives, a question of which no man or woman can be automatically certain. When one is certain, that one's choice is final, then marriage is, of course, a desirable state. But this does not mean that any relationship based on less than total certainty is improper. I think the question of an affair or a marriage depends on the knowledge and the position of the two persons involved and should be left up to them. Either is moral, provided, that, provided only that both parties take the relationship seriously and that it is based on values. As one who, uh, playboy, as one who champions the cause of enlightened self-interest, how do you feel about dedicating one's life to hedonistic self-gratification? Rand, uh, I am uh, profoundly opposed to the philosophy of hedonism. Hedonism is a doctrine which holds that the good is whatever gives you pleasure, and therefore pleasure is the standard of morality. Objectivism holds that the good uh, must be defined by a rational standard of value that pleasure is not a first cause, but only a consequence, that only the pleasure that proceeds from a rational value judgment can be regarded as moral, that pleasure as such is not a guide to action nor a standard of morality. To say that pleasure should be the standard of morality simply means that whichever values you happen to have chosen, consciously or subconsciously, rationally or irrationally, are right and moral. This means that you are guided by chance feelings, emotions, and whim, not by your mind. My philosophy is the opposite of hedonism. I hold that one cannot achieve happiness by random, arbitrary, or subjective means. One can achieve happiness only on the basis of rational values. By rational values, I do not mean anything that a man may arbitrarily or blindly declare to be rational. It is the province of morality, of the science of ethics, to define for men what is rational standard and what are, and what are the rational values to pursue.
So um, I'm going to stop at this particular point and just make the comment that so far, it started with uh, Play Playboy was uh, basically doing what the left usually does, and that is using a an interview under the or actually what they're doing is debating under the guise of conducting an interview, and they do that by asking leading questions. Isn't it true that um, didn't you say X Y Z? And uh, it has a more confrontational uh, tone to it, and it is uh, again where the interviewer is uh, trying to lead uh, the uh, interviewee astray and lead them to say uh, things that they don't necessarily want to say. Um, in this particular segment that I that I just got finished reading, the play the interviewer is doing it right by asking uh, positive questions that um, instead of leading questions like the last one was, as one who champions the cause of enlightened self-interest, how do you feel about dedicating one's life to hedonistic self-gratification? So this is f it's fair in that it gives the interviewee the opportunity to uh, explain how they feel instead of trying to trap them and steer them into a particular direction. Isn't it true that? Don't you feel that hedonism is a good idea? And um, so uh, that's the trap they normally use. And so far they've been, uh, you know, uh, at this segment of the interview, acting fairly, not only to the interviewee, to Ms. Rand, but actually to the readers. Because as a reader, you want to know about the person that's being interviewed. Ostensibly, you're reading about Ayn Rand because you want to know about her. What does she have to say on certain topics and issues? What does she have to, since Playboy's uh, primarily about sex, of course, what does Ayn Rand have to say about sex and promiscuity? So, and you want to know from her standpoint. You don't want it filtered through Playboy's preconceived notions. Okay, so it's uh, asking the, being fair and asking true interview questions, asking questions that are not leading questions is what's best for uh, the interview as a whole, including the interviewee and uh, the reader. So now when I uh, get back, I'm going to be going ahead to uh, the next Playboy uh, interview, which is the one I've been uh, reading uh, about uh, from Rush Limbaugh in 1993. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I also wanted to say about the last segment, the one area where uh, Ayn Rand again was going wrong was all the questions were asked in your opinion. And the problem with her responding that way is what she's trying to do when with her quote-unquote philosophy. And I think one of the reasons that she created her philosophy and made the error of creating her philosophy is she assumed that by coming out and saying that she has created her own philosophy, that she is um, going to speak with more authority. Not true. Uh, the way to speak with authority is to speak about reality, what it is that's real. Because after all, that's what everybody wants to know. What's real? What's going on? What should I do in my life? So um, they kept asking her, in your opinion, do you feel that? Do you think that? And she, uh, she bit. You know, she went ahead and said, told people what she thinks or what she feels, and that has less uh, authority to it than if she would have said, caught that and said, told her, uh, told the interviewer, in reality, what one should do is X, Y, Z. In reality, hedonism is a bad idea because it's bad for everybody, everywhere, at all times, because, and explain why. It's bad. Then if you want to have an argument or discussion as to whether or not uh, the explanation is rational, whether or not the facts are correct and the logic is good, you can have that argument. But uh, if you go ahead and immediately start with the, in my opinion, you're discounting what you're about to say and uh, you are uh, just lumping it in as a um, one among many opinions and your statement is going to uh, lack a considerable amount of authority. So uh, anyways, uh, we're on to Rush Limbaugh, 1993 interview with Playboy, where basically Playboy's doing the same thing to him that they were doing to Ayn Rand, which is uh, trying to engage him in a debate under the guise of 
uh, conducting an interview and also trying to um, w get him to contradict himself, present him with contradictory uh, things so that uh, they can present to their audience uh, somebody that is uh, essentially not a threat to them. Although um, I would imagine that basically Rush Limbaugh is, uh, because again, Playboy is hedonistic. It was a magazine about hedonism and about uh, sexual promiscuity and the supposed value of uh, sexual promiscuity and hedonism. And conservatism is a, a, a political philosophy that is opposed to that, that uh, seeks uh, to have uh, sex within the confines of marriage and uh, uh, serious monogamous, uh, having a serious monogamous relationship, i.e. marriage. So, Playboy, shall we talk about abortion? Limbaugh, give it a shot, fire the question. Playboy, many Americans believe the right to life movement is extreme. So here with Playboy, right away they're starting off with everything is mere opinion, and the only uh, difference between opinions is their popularity. So they're trying to make the claim that the, the right to the, the idea that the right to life movement is extreme is a very popular idea. Limbaugh, let me tell you something. There are extremists in the right to life movement, and there are plenty of them in the pro-choice movement. The arguments on the choice side of the issue are founded fundamentally in selfishness most sacred, beautiful thing on earth today is human life. And I believe that if we begin to treat it cavalierly and decide who lives and who dies, then we've cheapened it and are in the process of a societal decay. I mean, abortion is a huge profit center for a number of people. Let's face it, that's, a, uh, that's $300 in abortion times $1.6 million annually. Always follow the money, especially when people say it's not the money. It is the money. Playboy, what is your stand on Roe v. Wade? And here's an honest question. Excellent. Limbaugh, I think it's bad constitutional law. Playboy, so would you prefer to have it overturned? Again, good, excellent question. Not trying to lead him. Gives him the opportunity to, you know, come out and say what he, what he, what he believes and what he thinks. Limbaugh, very simply, I think abortion is a moral choice to be determined in a democratic fashion by the people. I don't think that to bend and shape and stretch the Constitution to distort it in order to find an obscure justification for this law is the way to go about it. And I don't understand why the choice people are so afraid of this. If so many people are pro-choice, hell, throw it to a vote and be done with it. Playboy. By state? Limbaugh. Yeah. Does a, a woman in our society have the right to do with her body anything she wants? No. There are laws against prostitution. There are laws against drug use. There are law, all kinds of precedence for society deciding what people can and can't do with their bodies. This goes for men, too. There's a second involvement here called sperm. It comes from somewhere, even if a woman is artificially inseminated. There's a father to be considered somewhere. And in many cases, the father is not given legal standing in these matters. The feminists don't want that to happen. That would be the death knell of the whole pro-choice argument. Choicers don't even want to talk about it because, to them, that's the end of their argument if they admitted they're, ta they're talking about life. And uh, so also another qu thing here is, um, let's see, uh, where he did get tricked, by the way. And this is, again, a classic where the, the right aids and abets the left. Uh, and it's kind of stupid, but that's the way it happens uh, a lot of time. Playboy, shall we talk about abortion? Here's another, what he should have stopped and said is, wait, you mean, do we want to talk about life? Sure, let's talk about life. Because, again, remember that who is it that came up with the idea that um, all elections should be on the issues and then decided what the issues were? The left. The left made those decisions. And the right, the conservatives, just fell into line. Oh, okay. If you say so, if you say abortion is the issue, not life, environment is the issue, not property, etc. Well, gee, no wonder that it is that conservatives get clubbed over the head uh, so often in interviews and uh, end up making uh, asses and fools out of themselves in public as often as they do. Uh, Limbaugh should have been smarter about this. He should have immediately changed the subject, not to abortion, because that puts him immediately on the defensive, but make it uh, a discussion about life, which puts uh, the um, interviewer and any uh, pro-choice person on the defensive where they belong. Um, let's see. 
Uh, suppose abortion was made illegal playboy in certain states. Would you actually contemplate punishing a woman who has an abortion in this culture? Limbaugh, nope, I can't. Playboy, what about prostitution? Should that crime require incarceration? Limbaugh, yeah, well, incarceration. I think there are better ways of humiliating people who engage in that. Publish the John's name in the newspaper. Uh, if you want to get rid of prostitution, make sure that every John is profiled on a current affair. That'll stop it. Playboy, let's move on. Music has been a big part of your life, correct? Limbaugh, yes, I love music. I mean, I don't like Ravi Shankar playing music with his toes. I grew up playing top 40, and that's still what I like the most. Playboy, what do you think about rap? Limbaugh, I think rap is single-handedly destroying a segment of our population. I don't think there's anything uplifting or admirable about it. There may be exceptions. Look, when I was growing up, it was the Beatles, and my parents hated the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. What did they uh, not like about the Beatles? They didn't like their hair or the way the fans acted. But listen to the early Beatles song. I saw her standing there. I want to hold your hand. Love me do. It wasn't until much later that the Beatles got into this revolution stuff. Now, look at rap music. You have two live crew describing the destruction of a vagina in a song called Me So Horny. It's not art. And you have Ice-T controversy, cop killer. Here's an angry, bitter guy, a guy who's profited incredibly from the system. There's so much hypocrisy in rap. So, um, and again, um, he possibly could have handled that a little bit better because one of the things that they did when they say, uh, what do you think about rap? is like saying, what do you think about music? Or what do you think about rock and roll? There's all kinds of different rock and roll. And the same thing with rap music. There's all kinds of rap. The rap that I think, um, well, that uh, obviously uh, Mr. Limbaugh is referring to is what's known as gangsta rap. Uh, there, because there are rap tunes that I have um, that I think are uh, very entertaining, well put together, well produced, and uh, put together by very talented people. And there's other rap tunes that I wouldn't listen to on a bet uh, that I can't stand. I can't stand for, I wouldn't want to listen to for five seconds. So there's all kinds of different, um, uh, like every other music, you come up with a style and then it immediately seems to generate um, sub-style. You have rock and roll, but you have different types of rock and roll. You've got rockabilly, for instance. You've got uh, stuff that's more like what he was, uh, Lumball was talking about, which is top 40. You've got pop music, pop rock, uh, bubblegum rock. There's all kinds of different, acid rock. Uh, heavy metal, etc. You can't just come out and say, well, all rock and roll is great or all rock and roll sucks. Um, it, you know, because then you're including uh, types of uh, musics that uh, are not going to uh, fit that mold, so to speak. So, And uh, that's uh, going to conclude the uh, Limbaugh interview. And then uh, when I come back, I'm going to be reading a couple of jokes from the New York City Cab Driver's Joke Book. Thank you very much. And um, so the uh, New York City Cab Driver's Joke Book is written by Jim Peach. And he's a New York City cab driver who has uh, collected jokes uh, in his own and one's uh, jokes from his fares over the years and compiled them into a rather uh, lengthy book. So a huge, broad-shouldered, mean-looking hulk of a man is in the supermarket. He goes to the fresh produce section and tells the produce clerk that he wants to buy just half a head of lettuce. You can't do that, the clerk tells him. But the man says, oh yeah? And tears a head of lettuce in half. When he goes to the front to pay, cashier tells him that he'll have to check with the manager before he can sell the man just half a head of lettuce. So the cashier walks over to the store manager and says, some big, dumb-looking asshole wants to buy half a head of lettuce. Just then, the cashier notices that the huge man has followed him to the manager's office, is standing behind him, and just heard everything he said. Thinking quickly, the cashier points to the large man and tells the manager, and this kind gentleman has agreed to buy the other half. A few days later, the store manager tells the cashier, I like someone who could think on his feet. In fact, I want to train you to become a manager, so I'm sending you up to Winnipeg, Canada for a training seminar. Winnipeg, Canada, the cashier responds with a grimace, but the only people who come out of Winnipeg are either whores or hockey players. 
I'll have you know, the manager says slowly, that my wife is from Winnipeg. Oh, really? The cashier responds. What position does she play? And with that, we conclude another episode of Storytime. And uh, until next time, thank you very much for joining me, and have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.